Good afternoon. Welcome to the BNH virtual event space. You are tuned in to Cinematic Wedding Portraiture, hosted by Canon. For that, I'd like to welcome award-winning wedding and portrait photographer Andre Brown. Andre, I swear we we didn't talk about this color scheme thing. We kind of it's like we showed up to the to the <laughs> event wearing the same outfit. This is right. not planned. Right, even with the black, bro. It's I know. Just... I'm like, wait, hold on. I, one of us is, I, I feel like I got to change something up, man. I'm, it looks like I'm trying to bite your style, but uh, I want to welcome you on. I know we have a great presentation for it, as you guys just even saw from that splash screen. Beautiful work. You're going to take us through what is cinematic photography and uh, how do we incorporate it into our wedding photos, right? Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Well, I'm going to leave it to the pro here and I'm going to get out of the way and I'll invite you guys, as you know, if you have any questions, feel free to get them in. And Andre, I'll see you in a little bit for some Q&A. All right, cool. Got it. What's Perfect. going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for BNH for having me. And special shout out for Canon for having me as well, being a sponsor on this event. Now, today we're going to be talking about cinematic wedding portraits. Um, this is a little bit different. You know, if you've been to any of my talks, you know, like I like to be very interactive. You guys won't be able to be interactive with me while we're doing this. But just be sure that you drop your questions in the different chats, and then we'll get back to that towards the end. Now, I do have a ton of slides, so I'm actually going to try to burn through this as, uh, as quickly as possible since we only have an hour. But again, be sure that you ask whatever questions so that we can address them all at the end. So for those who don't know who I am, my name is Andre Brown. I'm a wedding and portrait photographer based out of Atlanta. Um, I've been shooting since 2015, and you know, since then I've been you know, blessed to have been a, ban a brand ambassador for quite a number of companies in the industry, as well as winning a number of awards from different organizations. Um, I'm also the host of my own education platform and workshops at Boca Academy. And if you know me, you know I'm diehard team canon. So what I use to be able to create the images that I create, this is what my current setup is. So my R5 is is my workhorse. Um, I've been using it virtually since it came out, and um, you know it's it served me well. Does a really great job. I do have a backup camera, as all wedding photographers should, and that is my Canon EOS R. So I was an early adapter to the R as well. But you know, knock on wood, my R5 has been doing such a great job for me. I I don't even take that thing out of my bag at all. So. Um, Thanks for that. But my lens selection, uh, RF 28 to 70, you know, I'm a zoom shooter. So if you've seen any of my other videos, you know that I'm a huge advocate for the fact that I am a zoom shooter. So I roll with a modified version of what we consider to be the Holy Trinity in the 28 to 70 versus the uh, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, which is my go-to, one of my all-time favorite lenses. Um, for wide angle shots, I'm still using the EF 16 to 35 and the EF uh, 100 millimeter macro. And this is what I carry with me to wedding days. And if you want a, a full list of the gear that I have, so you can save this for later, just scan that QR code at the bottom right hand corner of the screen and you'll be able to download that. So cinematic wedding portraiture. So what is cinematic? You know, over the years, we've seen that the word cinematic has come up and it's it's like a, a buzzword but you know I like to I like to emphasize the fact that it's more than just a buzzword there's a lot more that goes into something being cinematic versus just a cool word to use to you know sound cool or you know raise your prices um and you know for me I come from the entertainment industry I was, do, I was working in entertainment prior to being a photographer, so I had the privilege of being exposed to a number of, you know, movie sets and TV sets and things of that nature, and as I started to develop my style as a photographer, I kind of geared toward what I knew at that point, which was the more, you know, cinematic style of photography. So by definition, cinematic means the visual qualities and aesthetic of a film or video. Now that can be done through a number of ways. One, lighting techniques. Um, if you are a fan of movies or anything like that, you'll notice that from obviously from scene to scene, 
the lighting is different, but um, it was funny when somebody pointed out to me that if you're watching a, a movie and you know even most TV shows, they shoot from the shadow side. So in terms of lighting technique, that would be something closer or more along the lines of a split light. I mean, excuse me, a, uh, a short light, which if you follow my work, you know that is my favorite, favorite lighting style. I shoot that with brides. I shoot that in grooms. Um, even in my portrait sessions, like maternity and things of that nature, that's typically my my go to. And then some of the other variants like um, split light and Rembrandt as well. Um, and then when it comes to being able to, to create a, a, a cinematic scene, there's also the use of ambient light and not just, you know, available light from things that are outside, but think, think of things like wall sconces and lamps and street lights, things like that, that will help kind of set the mood. So balancing your light to incorporate those things to be able to add, you know, visual interest to your shot and then using your main light to, you know, expose your subject the way that you want them to, to be exposed. Being cinematic also includes color grading and toning. I don't think that grading and toning is necessary all the time because even as you look through my work, you'll see that I don't really do a lot of grading. Um, I don't even think that I'm, I'm good with grading. Uh, but some of the times I do incorporate that into uh, my work and the but the purpose of like grading and toning is to kind of um, help, you know, produce whatever emotion that, you know, one is looking to deliver in a scene. So I have a couple of examples there. And two, if you want to know more about lighting techniques, for those who don't know, just scan their QR code and you'll be able to download that for free as well. But as we start to look at using using color to evoke tone and emotion, let's look at one of my favorite shows, which is Game of Thrones. If you watch Game of Thrones, you know the Ice King, he's from, you know, he's from beyond the wall where it's extremely cold, right? He's extremely cold, just running around and like, you know, often people throughout the show and adding them to his army so any scene that he's going to be in is going to you know have that cold more dreary look um to kind of set the stage for who he is and uh, in terms of character on the show and then here if you look at the the look on her face right it's a look of concern right so imagine if this was like the lighting or the toning in this was very warm, that look of, you know, kind of, uh, of concerned or wonder in her face, the emotion wouldn't necessarily, you know, come off the same way if it was like a really warmer tone. So using the, the blues in the shadows and even it looks like some blues in the highlights as well to kind of cool the overall scene down without making it as, as cold as this image. But it kind of helps, you know, push, uh, uh, push the narrative of the emotion that she's feeling in this scene. And then lastly, we have the wedding with Joffrey. Nobody liked Joffrey, even though this is a, a happy scene, right? Nobody liked Joffrey. But ultimately, if you see the, oh, that's actually not Joffrey. That's the brother, excuse me. But um, if you see the scene, there's like this happiness, this emotion on their faces. But we have like this warm tones, which is more inviting us into the scene um, to kind of, you know, feel the emotions and joy and happiness that they're experiencing in this moment. So those are the ways that, you know, film and TV use color toning and lighting to be able to evoke emotion. And that's the same thing that I do with weddings. And the last element of, you know, something being cinematic is visual storytelling. I don't think that this gets talked about enough throughout the process. It's more than just lighting. It's more than just toning. You have to set the scene and you can do that in a number of ways using establishers in terms of establishing shots, which we'll, we'll talk about today, as well as creating sequences, which my videographers who might be on would know. Um, but I think that that gets lost on photographers 
it's not just shooting one photograph. I know they say a picture is worth a thousand words. One picture is supposed to tell a story, but it's our job to curate the day and to create a, a narrative through the images. And we're going to talk a lot about that in this talk as well. So let's look at how I use what I just talked about, lighting, toning, and storytelling in the different aspects of the day. So the first thing is details. So this shot, the ring shot, my macro, which I think all wedding photographers should have. If you haven't heard me preach about that enough, I think this is probably one of the most slept on lenses that we have out there um, is the 100 millimeter macro. But I use my macro, one single light, that's window light coming in directionally to be able to add these highlight areas. I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but to add these highlight areas um, onto the, the different parts of the ring to accentuate it. But then where the light isn't, we have the shadow areas and the highlights and shadows is what creates depth inside of the images. So even the area that's in the, the back, if you can see that little, uh, that little gold ring, that was another element that I added to kind of push the narrative of where I wanted the eye to go. So the, that leading line coming in from the left side of the screen across to the right, it takes you from the left to the center diamond through the groom's ring. Um, and that's really just in the, invita the invitation that the couple had. And I used that and the goal was to kind of help shape where I wanted the viewer's eye to go. Next, shoe shot. Again, directional light. I'm using it more in a, a split, more Rembrandt lighting style, but I wanted to be able to show off how sparkly the shoes were. Had I shot this flat, it is a it does have sequins, so it may, you know, still have some sort of sparkle. But being able to light it from that side and you know, be able to show the texture from the sequin, I think really helps sell the viewer on, yeah, these are really fancy sparkly shoes. And those are the things that you need to consider while you're out there creating. You have some uh, cufflinks. These are some, you know, special cufflinks, very antique cufflinks that one of my grooms had. Again, directional light using reflections um, and that highlight and shadow was giving us depth so that you know, we can make the, the, the image visually interesting to our viewers. Another shoe shot. Um, this one is great because believe it or not, everything that's, that's back behind those shoes, the, the window light was so bright that I was able to dark it down. Everything that's back there is black is like, there's like champagne glasses and wine bottles and all of this stuff, right? But in the space that I was in, there wasn't really a way to, you know, kind of clean that up. But using that directional light to shape the shoes, you see we have the highlights on the front, we have the shadows on the side and the back that's giving us depth. But it also helped me to darken down everything else that's back there that's super distracting so that I can point my viewer to exactly what I wanted them to see. And that's highlighting the shoes. Same thing here, we're accentuating the, the stones. I'm using that light to be able to pull focus on what it is that I'm shooting here with my 100 macro. And if we look at, you know, a few different examples, I'm, I'm going to take you through some examples from the same series so we can see how it's not just one shot, but everything comes together in harmony to be able to create a cohesive look for things like wedding albums. So I start off with the shoes here, getting more, focusing on some more of the details, still using that directional light. We have the highlight across the top there, across the bottom, we're starting to get those, those shadows. picking off the little details. So we're, we're showing that, you know, we have these fancy Jimmy Choo shoes, 
but now we want to focus in on the specific details of the shoe to show just how extravagant they are. And as you can see, I took pictures of all of the details in a cohesive way so that this all looks, to, looks great together. All of these images could be together on an album spread and tell the story about you know, all of her details for the day. I think a lot of people get hung up on, this would be a cool shot for the dress. This would be a cool shot for the shoes. You know, this would be great for the rings, but it all has to come together to be able to tell a story in order for it to be cinematic. And I think that that, again, I think that that gets lost on a lot of people. You know, sometimes you have to, forego the cool shot for it to to make sense right because my approach to weddings just like everybody says is storytelling but are you really telling stories at the end of the day I want to be able to sell albums because no matter what they paid me for the wedding I can also you know make that again by producing an album for them and the more I'm able to make that, that album tell the story and the images come in and be harmonious, the more pages that I can sell in the album, which ultimately will make me more money. So let's look at another example of that. Completely different wedding, completely different color scheme. Still directional light, taking photographs of all of the different pieces that the bride has and merging them together in a in a in a way that they can lay together on the page and it will look cohesive and uh you know just very inviting as they get into the wedding album now this last example is a bad example we have all of the details that are shot together in harmony and then there's one outlier that one outlier at least to me um the the cologne bottle that I wouldn't even include in the album because it kind of breaks up the uh, the cohesion of everything that's there. We have our main shot, which is the, the bottom second from the right. That would typically be blown up on maybe one of the, like one side of the album page. And then the other pieces would be the little details picking off everything that's going on. So, you know, people can see all right, this is the scene being set and these are the little pieces of the scene. But I'll get into that a little bit more later as we start to talk about sequencing. Next, the prep stage. Um, some of you may or may not shoot prep. I know a lot of photographers that just don't shoot any prep photos at all. But if we're storytellers, those are all portions of the day that help us to, to make that overall story for our couples. So this is like that finishing touch, makeup shot, directional window light, nothing but window light, using color from the a room that's a little bit further down that it looks great against her skin tone and the, the, the choice for the, uh, the lip color just looks fantastic together. Same thing here more prep. The goal was a little bit more of a split light situation, but we do get a little bit of light up under my, my bride's chin here. So we have that highlight shadow, the highlight on her sister's face and falls in to shadow. So this is perfect. This is a perfect example of that cinematic look of using highlights and the marriage of highlights and shadows to be able to create visual interest in drama. Same thing here, bride and mom, highlight shadow, highlight on mom's face. And although it doesn't go into complete shadow, you know, you guys get it, right? Our grooms, <clears throat> excuse me, our groom here on the, the right-hand side of the frame. Yes, they're there doing their thing, but I wanted to be able to frame them on the left as well as a reflection in order to be able to, you know, create more visual interest in a space that was not very attractive. This is literally a hallway because they don't have any 
a place for the groom to really get ready in this space. More highlights and shadows showing off all of the detail and the texture of all of the jewelry and um, the garments that she has going on, uh, the detail in her sari, um, the, uh, the henna that's on her hand. And then just using backlight to be able to isolate our subjects, giving us, which I guess technically in this case would be a more short light kind of look. But as you can see, we still have, you know, details on the front side because that light's coming in, is wrapping around, and is giving us a nice contrast. So let's talk about establisher shots. Um, I think that this is a huge miss by a lot of people. If you watch any TV show or movie, you know, or if you've ever seen a script, there's always a page in the script where it'll say exterior and then explain what the exterior is. Then they'll go to interior. Then they'll you know, find whoever the subject or subjects are that they're talking to. And that's how they paint a narrative. Think about your favorite movie. As soon as it comes on, they establish whatever city it's in, right? They don't, doesn't come up on the screen and say Chicago or Atlanta. They show you a skyline. Most skylines people are familiar with so the audience inherently has an understanding of where it is this is being shot. So from there, they'll go, they'll cut to interior and so on and so forth. I include um, establisher shots in all of my wedding galleries. So this um, photo, we'll, we'll actually get to that in a little bit, but that's a venue here called The Estate here in Atlanta, a very uh, small but high-end venue. But you know, here's a shot from the exterior of the Four Seasons. And another. And then seeing them merge together. So we have the exterior of the Four Seasons here on the left. Giant building that's, you know, it's obviously weird shape shooting out with 16 to 35. But also capture the sign. Now, these two, these two images together, edited, of course, because these are not edited, but these two pictures together can be a panel spread in an album. So now you sold an additional page, but at the end of the day, it does help you to tell the story of the wedding day. Somebody can flip through the album, immediately see that it's the four seasons. And then from there, the rest of the gallery cuts to the interior of the room where the couple is getting ready um, or you know, whoever's getting you know, ready there and then moving through the rest of the day. And it's just kind of subconscious without saying, oh, where did you get ready? It's already established through the establisher shot. And I'll show you examples of how I use establisher shots, not even just with um, things like venues, but just in the room and I shoot it. I shoot these sequences over and over and over again throughout the day to help tell the overall story which leads us to the process of sequencing. So sequencing is basically taking a bunch of shots. There's no particular number of shots that, uh, that you need in order to be able to create a sequence. But the whole goal is to create a, a series of images that paint a narrative without the viewer having to ask or wonder what's going on inside of the scene. So this would be, I'm actually gonna take you through a sequence of images for you know details. So this is obviously all of the groom stuff. We know that just by, by looking at it, right? Shoes, cufflinks, watts, tie, belt, and pocket square. So we've, this is our establisher shot, but now we're gonna go in and we're gonna pick off the little individual details to emphasize them and help tell the story of what it is that he's wearing for the day. So emphasis on the cufflinks, emphasis here on the actual watch. Um, this, although the watch is like main focus, I really just wanted like a, a piece of the, uh, the fabric for the handkerchief without showing, you know, the whole thing. 
And then the same thing here, we're adding a little bit more texture um, from the tire to be able to show the actual texture. Now I have a panel spread inside of the book that tells us exactly what it was that he wore for the day. Hope that makes sense for you guys. If not, go ahead and drop it in the, the comments and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Same thing here, setting the scene. We see that you can see my bride has already, you know, got dressed. So we've, we've already done the earrings. We've already zipped the dress. Now I'm shooting an establisher shot for what's going on in this scene. We can see that, you know, because we shoot weddings, right? We see that the bridesmaid is putting on the shoe. But the establisher is, she's in a room. There's a cityscape in the background. And there's someone, you know, sitting there doing something. So now we pull our focus into this bridesmaid. We see that she's putting on the shoe. Now we highlight the fact that she's putting on the shoe. And then we highlight the shoe itself. And again, this is a, another series. This Things like this is what can take you from selling a 20-page album to a 100-page album. Because if it's laid out very well, telling the story of the day in the different parts of the day, if it's laid out extremely well, they'll come in and they'll they'll add those additional pages. Granted, you know, if they can afford it, right? But it's going to be very hard for them to go from something that's so well shot and well thought out and creates a narrative to breaking it down just to a bunch of you know singular photos that don't go together and don't really make much sense so as i mentioned i create you know sequences in every single part of the day over and over and over again now we have mom putting on the veil right so we've established that same thing in the room cityscape nice light we have the 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 detail on this side, even though that they're being backlit, we're focusing on mom and her being happy. And then we get a shot of the bride and mom being happy. Those three images, you know, coming together, one, two, three, that's one singular sequence. Moving on here, we have our bride, she's sitting down, she's looking at something. I was able to kind of pick up mom's reaction on the other side. Um, I wish it, it hadn't happened in the moment and I had a light on her to be able to make her pop off, right? But the story here is primarily the bride and what she's doing. We just so happen to see mom um, looking on in joy as well. So we see the bride, she's holding something. We want to figure out more about what's going on. We see that it's a card. And then we open it up. We can see the words that, you know, her fiance wrote to her, as well as the super expensive pair of shoes that he that he bought her as well as a gift for the actual wedding day. So I encourage you to tell these, tell these stories, these little mini stories to be able to tell the overall story of the wedding day. This sequence is two images. He's putting on the watts. So you got the close up of the watts and the cufflinks, right? And then we have the picture of just him um, more full body. So you see his face and that sort of thing. Here's another great example. Um, this groom is writing his vow. So I'm inside of the actual bedroom, but I shoot through um, the doors and past all of the junk and the people that are in there, right? to be able to capture an image of him doing something as we see here on the left-hand side. And then as we start to move from left to right, now we go from what is he doing at this desk to focusing in on exactly what he's doing as we get to the far right side of the frame. Now back to this image from earlier. Um, yes, I was, I was very much so hung up on being able to get this reflection shot, because again, the room is like, you know, really ugly. Um, but I wanted to, you know, create a series that again, I could sell into like a multi-page spread. So we see that the, the groom, excuse me, yeah, that the groomsman is, you know, doing something with his shirt. We know that it's cufflinks. 
So we move in a little bit closer on a 50-50 shot. And then we focus in with the macro to be able to get exactly what it is that he's doing as well. And if we look at that all put together from, um, from one wedding, we have our establisher shot when outside of the venue. So this is, you know, the, the venue itself. Then now we have a shot just highlighting the actual venue. Cut to interior. We see a wedding dress. Now, you know, we I got keep forgetting you guys can't see my mouse, but you know, that middle window, it's so big and prominent. We understand from the very beginning that as soon as we cut in here, that's what we were looking at before. It's easy to make that assumption for a viewer when they see this. And then now we focus in on that window with the dress hanging in. And since it's a wedding dress, we understand that this is the bridal suite, right? So now anybody just kind of scrolling through, they understand we're outside of a wedding venue. We move in to the interior. There's a dress hanging up. It's the bridal suite. So we hit the dress from afar, establishing the dress. We shoot in a little bit closer to be able to capture the details. And then we go shoes. Bride shoes. Now let's pick off the actual details of the shoes so we can see, you know, how, you know, fancy or ornate they are. So our establisher shot with the bride getting dressed. Mom is putting on the actual veil. Her sister is holding the veil. We shoot that same shot from a different angle and a different perspective. We get mom and the joy that's on her face and then the sister in the background. And now we've just, you know, just little series like that, shooting with that kind of mindset is what makes things to be cinematic. And if you shoot like that, you'll 100% be able to increase your post sales. I know some people aren't into, you know, post sales and having to sell albums and stuff like that. I, I encourage you to be able to do so because you're leaving a lot of money on the table at that point. But ultimately, I, I mean, as we're shooting through, you see like I'm in these rooms, I'm backlighting things. Um, and I need to be able to capture all of those details and be able to pull out those details. So that's why I rely on my gear so much, being sure that I have the right gear that's going to help me to be able to produce that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on as we talk about um, getting it right in camera. Let's talk about portraits <clears throat> really quickly. So. Portraits are the, the highlight of most people's day. Most of the time when people talk about, you know, things being uh, cinematic and they're just focusing on the actual portraits themselves. But the portraits are a part of the larger day. You want everything to go together seamlessly. You can't have, you know, uh, vanilla ice, ice, ice baby on verse one, right? And then don't Stop Believing be verse two. Those two songs don't mess together. So you want to be able to shoot everything together cohesively for it to be cinematic, right? And for it to all flow together. And I'm not saying that every single thing throughout the day is going to be cinematic. That's it's just not possible, right? But you have to be able to have discernment on the pieces that you need to put together so that when you lay it all out in storyboard form, that they all flow together. This is one of my one of my favorite images. I um, shot this quite a few years ago, but um, you know, just the the marriage of the highlights and the shadows, being able to pull all of those details out. Um, and without the dynamic range of my camera, I think at the time I was using the um, 1DX Mark II when I captured this, it's one of my favorite cameras ever. But, you know, with the ability to be able to, to get the, the dynamic range. Now, in truth, yes, those, those light rays are very much so artificial, but 
the original light rays are there. Like that was something that was actually coming through. And I just had to go in and accentuate them um, to, to make them come out in the, uh, the final image. But without having the right gear and you know, being able to have the dynamic range and understanding like your, your gear, understanding how to manipulate the, the histogram to be able to then later on go through and pull out those details. Um, without the ability to be able to do that, you won't be able to create images like this. Same thing here. <clears throat> this is like in action shot. My bride is coming down uh, the stairs to go down the aisle into the ceremony. And I just kind of sat there and, you know, laid in wait to find the, the perfect moment. There's a big giant window coming in, which uh, stained glass window. So it's giving us a little bit of, you know, color on her skin, but positioning her using composition. So she's on the third to tell the story about what's going on. Had I put her in the middle of the frame, then yeah, we would have been able to tell that she was going down the stairs, but I'm using the composition of obviously the stairs going down, but her on the left third going into the right third to be able to help emphasize the fact that she's on her way down the stairs. So again, aesthetics of things being cinematic as well, which includes lighting, composition, and color toning. You see that I added those rich tones, um, warmth in the highlights and warmth in the shadows to evoke the emotion of, you know, more happiness, more, you know, brightness as she's heading down the aisle to go meet her groom. Same thing here. Um, I really wanted to be able to get those highlights inside of the, uh, the curtains, right? Uh, and I mean, this is a, a super, super small room. So I'm shooting this 16 to 35 F4, but this was, I think, one DX2 days as well. And I'm really paying attention to my histogram because as you can see, I pulled the, the blinds down a little bit, one, to narrow the light in the overall room, but two, to also kind of shape her within a particular box, but I didn't want to lose the highlights that are in the curtains so that you can see all of the depth and definition that's going on. Plus, if you, you know, look in, you can still see all of the texture that's on her dress as well from all of the uh, embellishments. I think that's, uh, I think on her dress, it's lace. And then even how it moves down to the bottom where the sheer fabric and the lace is at the bottom having a camera that has great dynamic range um, to so that you have more information inside of your histogram is crucially important with being able to create images like this. And just that little kiss of a, a light there on her cheek to kind of, you know, carve it out, it's fantastic. So we talked a little bit earlier about the use of ambient light as well to kind of help set the tone and in, in the uh, to paint the overall picture. At this particular venue, it's known for its or ornate details, right? It has like these big chandeliers and stuff throughout the whole building. Now, had I shot this and underexposed the, uh, the chandeliers or the wall sconces, this image wouldn't have had the same effect. Same thing goes had I shot it and I had blown those out completely right? It would have changed the entire mood of what's going on inside of this image. So very first thing is exposing for the highlights in those particular pieces. So I'm darkening the scene down to my, my light bulbs inside of the, uh, the little candle light bulbs that are inside of the chandelier and the wall sconces are at a place where they're properly exposed. And then from there, I'm just illuminating her because I still, based on histogram, have all of the details still left in uh, the architecture of the building. So you can look at the top and just imagine feeling the texture that's going on and, you know, kind of help you be in that room and imagine what it would, you know, feel like to be in that room or to 
what it would feel like to actually touch that particular texture. So you have to keep those things in mind while you're out here creating. Like you, you have to think about the way that an image makes somebody feel versus just taking a shot and moving on. One light setup, which is all window light in this particular case, you know, being able to, to take the available light that's in the room, you can see we're in a hotel room, there's curtains there. And the goal for me here was to take the curtains and narrow them down pretty much like a strip box to just give me that nice little, you know, hit of light on the side of his face to be able to create short light. Now, I did have to raise the exposure on him and, you know, the broad side of his face in this shot because, you know, it was basically a, a strip box. So there wasn't much light coming across there. But because I exposed properly and I had a camera with high dynamic range, my, um, my R5 at this point, I was able to pull back that detail that would have effectively put him in a split light situation. Like there was almost barely no light on the broads out of his face in his image, as well as the, the detail in his jacket with the embellishments of the, um, the paisley pattern that he has going on. But then also using toning to bring out the richness, but not only in his jacket, but the scene as, as ornate as the, the jacket looks, it kind of gives a regal feel. So using tones that would help accentuate that so a little bit of green in the shadows uh, like a, a greenish blue really but a little bit of green in the shadows and then adding warmth into the highlight to one accentuate the pillows um, which you can't see in this shot maybe barely over to the uh, top right you can see that there's a little bit of light spill from the wall sconce that's up there and that's illuminating part of the uh, the curtains as well. So it's giving off a warm tone. So because the green wall is getting a warm tone, I also wanna be able to introduce that warm tone into every other place of the image, including his, um, his skin tone to be able to create the mood that I was looking for for that image. And now, once you've you've done that, you figured out the lighting and um, you know how you can go through and tell stories, you can do that with portraits as well. So now we're talking about a spread of um, just the bride. I believe the spread in their album was four images across. I took a series of images with her. These are two of them. We have a shot of just her straight on. I have a shot of her turning her face more so into the light, but we get all of the detail and texture that's inside of um, her, uh, her hair piece there. And that's just storytelling on and on and on. So it's not just, you know, the single photos of the bride, it's multiple photos going on to show us what she's looking like, show us what the dress is, showing off earrings, details um, in this shot. We're also getting makeup. So that's a great shot for the makeup artist that will be you know, shared over and over again because we're getting all of the details in the, uh, in the uh, eye makeup and the lashes and all of that great stuff. Just going through that process over and over and over again throughout the day to be able to create a narrative for what the couple's wedding day looks like. Same thing here, window light this time versus uh, artificial light. So the, the lighting that you choose doesn't matter. It's all about the lighting pattern and how you use it and manipulate it. Definitely go in and, and close down curtains inside of the room to be able to, you know, to direct the light in the manner that you want to be able to direct it. I remember when I first became a wedding photographer, you hear people say, oh, you're supposed to be like a fly on the wall. Absolutely not. Because moments happen when they happen, right? But at the same time, I need to be able to curate those moments. You want to have a moment with dad? Sure. But that's not always going to happen 
in a place where the light is going to uh, be conducive of the way that I want it to look. So if you want to have a moment with dad, that's great, but let's have it over here. Then that way I can kind of set the scene and then let them organically go in. So it doesn't take away from the cinematic look that I'm trying to create, but it also becomes part of the story that's unfolding. Dad is having a, a first look with the bride and that sort of thing, but it also looks the way that the details look. It looks the way that the uh, that the uh, uh, couple's portraits look. Because imagine if you let her run towards the front door of the hotel room where there's there's no good light. You got a top flash. It, it's just not, there's not going to be that cohesion when you can simply say, yeah, we can make those moments happen, but we want to make them happen here. We want to be able to curate and set the stage for how everything looks overall. And again, with just being able to take portraits and build multiple series out of those portraits, highlighting different things. We have our, our bride wearing a black dress. Now I have her turned to the side. I'm getting that eye makeup. I'm getting the barrette in the hair. But she also had, you know, pieces inside of the back of the hair, too, that I wanted to be able to highlight. Plus, we we're able to see how defined her back is. Now I have a, a series of images put together that tell the story about what the bride is wearing on the day. Now, let's look at couples portraits. If you know me, you know I'm, I'm big on wall art. I, I love wall art and I want to be able to capture unique pieces for my couples as much as possible. This is typically why people are, are coming to me. This is typically why, you know, I'm selling 20 by 30s, 30 by 40s on a regular basis. And I want to be able to create those very, you know, dramatic cinematic portraits for the couples that look like, you know, works of art. Now, on the day of, obviously, it doesn't look like this. We all we all know that. But our goal is to be able to expose the, if we're in an environmental setting, we want to expose the environment um, in a manner that we can manipulate later on the same way that I did here, but also use some sort of artificial lighting to be able to um, accentuate our couple to make them pop off the screen. So that dynamic range in the camera is what's allowing me to be able to, to do that, to be able to bring down the overall scene, but still retain detail in, inside of the shadows that even if it's on the darker side during the capture, I can pull that up in the uh, shadow slider to be able to pull all of that, that information back, but then also be able to control the highlights on the couple in the scene as well. And as you can see, the, the lamp that's on in the shot, that was big too. Like wanting to be sure that I captured all of those little details to help tell this story or paint a picture rather for this particular image. Same thing here, dramatic skies, directional light, highlight shadow um, in, the, in, the, in the sky itself and the same thing on the actual couple. This image in Paris, um, look how detailed the information is on those actual buildings. Now, this image was shot at F4. This is at F4. So even though it looks extremely sharp, which it is because the RF lenses are just that sharp, right? But even though it's at F4, we're getting all of the detail inside of the clouds. We're getting all the detail inside of the building. You can see the collar on his shirt, the buttons on his shirt. And we just got that, you know, one direction of light that's coming in. Um, even though it's early in the morning, the sun hasn't, you know, really come up. But, you know, the light is coming from the right side of the frame, as we can see how it hits on her chest. And then on the building on the left side of the frame, um, how it has most of the light there, but that's helping us to be able to shape the overall look inside of this image. So be mindful, be mindful of the light. 
and understand too that sometimes you have to over underexpose in order to be able to um to let your final image get to the place that you want to be because i i exposed for the actual building i put no lights on the couple themselves but because i had so much information inside of the the raw file with my r5 i was able to just pull up the shadows on the couple and you know you can still see the details inside of their faces this is more like the image that you know i showed you guys earlier so just using that one single light of window light that's being backlit but we still get so much more uh information on the front side without having to illuminate the couples because the light is wrapping one but two um we can boost those shadows in the place in the places that we need to and i knew i needed to boost the shadows on him because of like his beard and um like he's getting less light on his face than what she's getting on hers more couples portraits this is engagement but same thing highlights shadows detail in the shadows this image was also shot at f4 um 16 to 35 and look at the detail in that look at the detail in the trees and that's all because my camera captures the information that i need in order to be able to show that depth inside of the image this is one of my favorite images from last year um later on in this i actually have a, a breakdown where i show you how I, I captured this but um just look at all of the detail in that another image shot at <laughs> at f4 um you know and this was this is either 16 to 35 or 14 to 35 i can't remember what i was using um at that particular time but um to to be able to have all of that information and control my my lights um that are on the railing down where the groom is and then illuminating both of my subjects to be able to create this beautiful piece that they ended up turning into a uh, a 30 by 40 wall portrait more here this image i actually won an award with with this image one light And now we're going to talk about creating, like taking uh, single couples portraits and turning them into a series as well. So this shot is actually not a couples portrait. This was actually taken during the first look. So whereas I'm across the way photographing this shot behind the pillar to the left of the groom, my second shooter there is also capturing. So I knew that we were going to be setting up for the first look. I knew this is what my establisher shot was going to be. Obviously, for them, the moment is the moment. Like they want to be able to, to come together and have a moment. But because I like to set the stage, I was able to take this image. Well, my goal was to take this image as an establisher shot for the actual first look. And then you can see that my second shooter was capturing the images on this side as they were having their moment so you have to you have to do what you need to do in order to be able to tell those stories the wedding day is full of just many stories it's not just one big story there's a bunch of little stories that end up happening throughout the way, throughout the day. And you need to tell those little individual stories to help tell the overall story. And while you're doing that, then it puts you in situations like this, where I have this beautiful portrait of the bride and groom here in the middle, but then I have some more close up shots of them as well. But creating series of images uh, like this or sequences of images like this helps me to be able to sell this corp this couple on a 20 by excuse me a 30 by 40 large frame in the middle that they can also do 20 by 30s flanking of the two images on the side so now that takes me from one wall portrait 
to three wall portraits, which always helps to just increase my overall bottom line. Plus they get, you know, great artwork out of it that when it's all said and done, friends and family come over, they see it, they admire it, and hopefully they come back and they hire you for, you know, their weddings and events as well. So don't forget to go in and, and do what you need to do to tell those stories in every single part of the day. Now, I've, I've heard people say that there's, you can't create, you know, cinematic group portraits. And if you follow me, you know that I very much so beg to differ, um, whether it's natural light or whether it's um, a, a, a constant light or flash, I've done it with them all. This was kind of like the first image that kind of, that really helped me to define what I wanted my overall photography style to be. Remember I said earlier, I came from entertainment. So it was a lot of time on like movie sets and, you know, TV shows and things of that nature. Um, but when I became a wedding photographer, the barometer for uh, what was wedding photography was the knot. So that was kind of what I was shooting initially. What's going to get me featured on the knot, so on and so forth. And uh, this particular wedding, <clears throat> right before the ceremony, I'm shooting the groom down here. I'm like, let me get the groomsmen, right? And I just placed them strategically. This is window light. So I literally just had to move them around and place them in positions where the light was going to illuminate them. I had no control over the light itself. If you see that window on the left-hand side there, it's another window just like that in one of the panes because uh, they have like these little motorized uh, panes on the outside. One of the panes was up. So it was just like a kiss of light coming through. And my poor uh, groomsman, the second one from the right-hand side, I literally, I was moving him around like a chess piece to get him exactly where it was that I needed him to be for the light to be able to hit him. Cause when he moved forward, the light wasn't, light wasn't hitting there. And I, I moved him around as much as possible until I just pushed him as far back in the room as humanly possible. I shot with compression that helped to pull him in to the overall frame. You would think that they're a lot closer than what they are, but that's the, the power of using your tools. Lens selection, focal length, uh, f-stop, composition, lighting. These are all the things that you need to use to be able to create the narratives that you want to create. It's not just one thing. It's just not lighting that makes something cinematic. You know, it's not just the toning, which I, I added, you know, toning to this image as well. Blues and the blue greens and the, the shadows, um, yellows in the highlights to be able to bring some warmth to the image and match those uh, the Einstein bulbs that are that are uh, hanging up above. Same thing in the bridal suite. Big gigantic, you know, windows on the side. In hindsight, I wish I had you know closed these windows down on the left hand side. Um, in the back to kind of create more depth and drama. But when things are happening in the moment and you're just kind of, you know, going with the flow, you're, you're able to just go in and capture. This is where my R5, um, and as you can see, I pull those shadows up. Most of my work, you'll see, I pull the shadows up as much as possible because I don't really like any super, super black points. I want, um, I want detail in every place that I can get it so that we can see the texture. Um, we see the we see the texture in the robes, like our grooms here in the middle, they have um, kind of two-tone robes going on. You see the difference between the two types of fabric that they have. And I'm able to do that in a dark, in a setting that would typically be dark by raising up my shadows so that you can see those details. Same thing here with these ladies, 70 to 200, as close to 200 as possible to uh, compress them into me more and compress the, 
the bird cages that are in the, the backdrop to be able to pull it in so it looks more like a backdrop versus a background. Our guys, same wedding, but everywhere you look, you see details, 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 and toning. I did tone this image as well. Some of these group shots you all are probably familiar with, but seeing my work from different award uh, competitions that I won with. Same thing, details, details, being able to get the texture of everything. Another image shot at group photo. This was, if I'm not mistaken, this was F4, um, maybe five, six, but probably F4 because I'm generally <laughs> at F4. Look at all of the, the details. You see that the suits are black, right? But they have um, more velvet on the lapels versus whatever the material the jacket is made out of. And I don't want it to just be black because tuxedos are, are black. I want you to be able to see the texture between the two and then adding that blue tone to the shadows um, to make it a little bit of cool. And then the warmth into the, um, into the, the skin tones, the highlights with that yellow just creating that look that I've become, you know, known for here in my market. So getting it right in camera, I'm not sure how much time we got left, but, you know, Derek, stop jumping in if, uh, if you need to, but. Now, Andre, you that, rock, man. Getting it fin right in up. camera <laughs> is very much so misconstrued. Um, I think a lot of times people look at images, when you're taught as a photographer, get it right in camera. And we, we might look at images, final product and say, okay, this person took this photo. When they took this photo, it came out and it looked just like that. But getting it right in camera has more to do with being able to get it to that final result that you want to get it to versus it looking exactly the way that you want it to look out of camera. Some situations that's very much so possible. Right. In many situations, it's, it's very much so possible, but we also have to account for the fact that sometimes we need to edit beyond whatever it is that we see just there. So, you know, for images like these, I take these images at just about every wedding. You've seen examples of me with the bride. You've seen examples of me doing this um, with the groom like this one here. Right. We're able to get all of those details inside of their coats, the skins, you can make out, you know, their faces and so on and so forth. But this is what that image actually looks like during the capture. But I understand that in order to be able to get a final result to be able to, you know, get the cityscape in the background, I can't pull, I can't pull my exposure up more to get their skin because it's going to blow that background completely out. I mean, it's it's close there. But as I'm shooting, I check in my, my histogram for my highlights and shadows to be able to be sure that I still have information. So although sometimes on the screen, it might show you that um, it might look as if it's blown out. Some people might have their highlight alert on. I don't. I just look at the histogram. And I put my histogram inside of the, uh, the viewfinder so that it's always there and I could be mindful of, of what's going on. But I knew I had a lot of information in shadows and I was just about at that point where there was gonna be no information in the highlights. So exposing for um, the, the highlights, but also exposing for the fact that um, my shadows, I needed to be able to be sure that I had shadow detail and being able to create images like this when it's all said and done. And this ended up being a perfect um, panel spread inside of the groom portion of the album and then segueing into all of the other shots that came before and after that, again, shooting from different angles to be able to, to tell the story. 
So this is our last section, I believe, where we're going to go in and we're going to break down um, some of the different images so you can kind of get an idea where things where things are in the final product, but also see how we were able to get there as well. So again, this is one of my, my favorite images from the last year. Um, the venue itself wasn't really the greatest venue, but you know, this scene was going to be the highlight for me. Um, and I knew I needed to catch, I needed, I knew I needed to capture at least one stellar photo. Cause again, I want that, that wall art sale. So I saw the staircase and the way that it was kind of looping around and I knew I needed to place them in a manner, um, that was going to have some sort of, um, I hate to use the word story, but you know, story, like they needed to be able to connect. So I decided to use the leading lines of the rail to be able to connect them. So we start at the top left and we move around to the bride, we follow the rail around and it takes you around to the groom. So that's using composition to be able to do it. You can obviously see that there's toning on the image, um, warm highlights. I didn't really do anything inside of the shadows to cool it down. Um, I just was sure that I raised them up. So the lighting itself on them, not quite short light, you know, but you know, more in that direction of a Rembrandt short light to be able to add drama on them. So like we talked about earlier, so lighting, composition um, and image toning to be able to create a more cinematic look and lots of lots of editing to be able to pull this off but if we look at what it looked like when I shot it this is what it looked like when I shot it but during that process of me shooting I know that all right I'm looking at my histogram I have um, my highlights are good. My shadows are good. The floor situation, I knew the floor was going to be a nightmare. That was going to be a Photoshop nightmare because those are um, just the, the ambient light that's, that's in there. But the only ambient or practical light that I wanted to keep was the one that was on the handrail because that also, you know, goes into our actual groom. So we can see him there as well. Um, so, excuse me, so that we can lead into him there as well. But this is what that overall image looked like during the shot. But I knew that this was the final image. You know, there was no way that I would be able to capture that without getting like the light spill um, on the couple, you know, on the wall from the modifiers that I was using. There's no way that I would have been able to capture that just directly out of camera. So that goes back to getting it right in camera is knowing how far you'll be able to manipulate certain things that you're um, that you're trying to do in the overall image. So as we move on here, we've seen this you know venue from a shot earlier on, but same thing. I want the structure of the building. I want the sky to be able to um, manipulate to create that, that drama for my signature edit shots, right? But it was a gloomy day. I needed to um, I, I needed to be able to be sure that I got the building exposed correctly. And I also got um, light on my subject. So I set up two lights, the couple themselves. Um, they were, uh, excuse me, I have the, the one light on the right illuminating her. I know she's the main subject in this particular shot. My light on the left-hand side of the frame is just enough to, to add uh, detail to his face so that it doesn't go into complete blackness. And then my poor assistant, Ty, who's you know running around collecting lights after tossing the veil so that we can get this overall shot. And as you can see, that one little light that we had on the left-hand side is just enough to be sure that his face doesn't go into blackness and it doesn't blend into the building there on the backhand side. And we can see the expression on both of their faces. 
same venue, different couple, similar lighting setup. Since I didn't have them together, um, I wanted to be able to create that directional light. So this time, two lights, um, but one light with more emphasis on one versus the other. So if we can see Ty's, you know, moving those lights there, pulling them out of the shot, but it's all directional light to be able to help us create the overall mood that I'm trying to go for and uh, that they love. They got this in a 24 by 36 canvas. So we're at Q&A. Anybody has any questions? I know Derek, you're there. Yes, I'm coming back in. I want to thank you, Andre, for that wonderful presentation. We do have some questions. Our first question coming in from Garrison, joining us here on Zoom. Uh, so Garrison has some of the same cinematic uh, influences as you, but also wants to know if you have experimented in the 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio at all. And also, if there you have any other movie or TV series that you champion as your biggest cinematic influences? On one, I don't have any cinematic influences. Um, I think that over the years, had I done that more, I, I watched more movies or TV in order to um, to kind of pull ideas from, probably would have made me a better photographer. So I, I encourage you all to do that. But even in my earlier years, when I worked in entertainment, I had no desire to be a photographer. So I wasn't like trying to pull that stuff you know, in when I when I did have access to like gaffers and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, no cinematic influencers. I don't really look at other people's work unless I scroll across it on Instagram. But I do encourage you guys to do that. I feel like you can really grow and get some ideas from that. It's one thing that I regret not doing earlier on, which obviously I can start at any time, but I, I definitely think you should do that. What was the other question? I'm sorry, kind of rambled. And he was asking if you've ever experimented with the 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio. Bro, you're just speaking Greek to me, man. Like, <laughs> I'm being completely honest with you. Like, I, I think that people get into, like, the technical stuff way too much. And I feel like, I feel like it cripples us, which is why I stay away from looking at other people's work. I stay away from, like, digging too much into the the technical stuff, because you can become so technical that you kill your creativity. And I've had friends who went to photography school that told me that it was like, oh, I was into photography. Then I went to photography school and I learned all of this technical stuff and um, it, it killed my creativity. And I'm like, OK, I mean, I, I picked it up on I watched some YouTube videos and I booked some jobs and you know, you just go in and go play, you know, you go in and you go play. Obviously, you got to get the stuff that you need to get for the clients. But um, whatever that aspect ratio is, more power to you, bro, because I have no idea what you're talking about. I love that. You just go with the feeling, right? With what looks right. I just go with what looks right and what feels right. You know, I don't want to get caught up in in the super technicals. We can get into analysis paralysis, Right. Um, I'm an overthinker by nature in general. I don't need another thing to, you know, obsess over because I will obsess over it. <laughs> <laughs> I love this next question that came in from Deshaun joining us on YouTube. What's How up? do you handle guests getting in the way with camera phones, their cameras, their phones? Where, where are we at right now in the wedding industry with that? You know, it's, it's funny, man. Like when I, <laughs> This is going to sound so bad. Um, when I started, you know, I was taking the cues from, you know, the things that you, you know, you hear because prior to shooting a wedding, I had never really been to a wedding. Right. So I didn't really have like those experiences and know what to anticipate. And um, later on in my first year of photography, I had done my first India wedding with some buddies of mine. I don't know if any of them are watching, but um I remember the one guy, the main guy, he was just like, hey, man, they get in your way, bump them. You know what I'm saying? Because they could just be, you know, they could get, you know, pretty rowdy or whatever, right? And uh, I thought he was playing until, yeah, I mean, I've seen this. I do not advise people to do this, but I've seen them take phones completely out of people's hands, put them back in their hands and just be like, move. 
you know, especially depending on how intense the wedding is, like we have a limited amount of time to do our job. We cannot sit there and take photos for everybody. You have to stand your ground, you know, and and tell people, no, you can't just always be appeasing with those situations. I don't take camera phone pictures. I don't do that. Find a find another guest, find a second shooter or whatever. And, and I, I'm not doing that. I have to focus on delivering for my client because they're going to be mad at me. They're not going to be, they're not going to say, oh, well, we know you didn't do this because you were taking photos for Aunt Susie and Uncle Bob. You know, they don't care about that. They just care about what I got and what I didn't get. So what those people need are not my problem. A great point. Uh, Harry has a great question playing off kind of your uh, saying that you have limited time. How much of your methodology do you discuss with your clients? And then how do you handle the resistance or if there is any resistance from the wedding planner? So you you obviously you have a style that requires it's not so much run and gun. There is work. There is effort. There is you're, you're the client is hiring you for your beautiful portfolio and that's what they want. How much of that do you discuss with them? Do they need to know how the sausage is made or are they just, you tell them minimally what they need to know and then you handle your handle? As y'all can tell from my talk, I am an over explainer, right? So I do have <laughs> some, some dialogue and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is how much time I need to be able to do it as well. So I know we're supposed to do this at this time, but I'm letting you know, if you want this, this is how much time I need. Do I always get it? No. Do the shots always happen? No. But then they have to come to grips with the fact that other elements like, oh, I want to do a viral TikTok thing like that affected your overall, you know, portrait or whatever it is that you that you want to have. I used to kill myself, man. And like, trying to be perfect for these clients every single day and let's face it we're not just trying to please the client we're trying to please the planner the baker the designer you know for those of us who shoot weddings that are like heavy on decor you know things of that nature right like you're you're having to serve so many masters in that but you have to be able to find a balance because if not you will drive yourself crazy. Atlanta is one of those markets that's heavy on wedding planners, right? And wedding planners just about have their own shot list sometimes, like, you know, things it is that they that they want. And it can be a pain in the butt, but at the end of the day, you have to understand that your client is the one that's going to you know, hold your feet to the fire. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. I want a refund. They don't care what the planner wants. You have to serve that client first and then everybody else second. Mm, wonderful outlook. We're going to sneak one last question in here for you, Andre. Elizabeth is asking, how do you take a picture in bright sunlight without squinting? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My answer is just avoid it. Avoid bright sunlight. Any Any oh. tips for that? I'm assuming she's talking about like without the couple squinting. Um, if that's the case, I typically don't. I don't typically turn. Ugh, that's a hard one to say. I was going to say I don't typically turn my couples into like hard sunlight, but I do. I shoot overseas a lot. I've been to Dubai like a million times with like clients and like hosting workshops and stuff. And I like to tell people to, you know, utilize the light. I'm big on chasing light. That was the one of the biggest things that um, drew me to being a wedding photographer because you spend the day chasing, you know, light. Oh, this window's got good light. Oh, there, here's got good light. And it was exciting for a little while, right? But kind of burnt out on that at some point. But if you're talking about the couple, you know, most definitely you can have them turn their faces in direction of light, and then count them down to open the eyes for the shot. Um, I know sometimes that doesn't work. I have I've had a groom who just couldn't be outside without sunglasses on just in general, right? His eyes were really sensitive. My eyes are extremely sensitive. Um, so I'm not trying to stare into the light at all either. But um, yeah, I would I would basically say just count them down. Three, two, one, open the eyes, click, and then have them close back. 
And, you know, hopefully you got the shot and you can move on. And don't be afraid, afraid to do it multiple times if you, you need to. Mm. Give them the Deion Sanders look. <laughs> only, my, only my college football fans will know about that one. <laughs> Had to throw it in there. Um, uh, Andre, this was great, man. A ton of information. I want to thank you for coming on. All the expertise that you put into this. Beautiful, beautiful images and great information behind it. And, of course, thank you, Canon, for hosting today's event. And to all of our people out there watching, listening, whether you're watching it live, watching it on the replay, we thank right. you as well. All of Andre's information is there. Please definitely go support him, follow him, check his work out, and uh, check us out every once in a while. We're here Monday through Thursday. We'll see you guys next time on another round of the BNH Virtual Event Space. Catch you all next time. Later.